This broadcast of In Focus is being made possible through the support of Reed Health. Reed Health, right beside you. And by First Bank Richmond, with eight locations serving Wayne County. First Bank Richmond and you, doing great things together. And by Morrison Reeves Library, where you can check out an endless variety of movies, binge-worthy TV series, graphic novels, books, games, toys, and CDs. Stream movies and audiobooks with the MRL Digital Library, open 24-7. Visit MRL Downtown Richmond or online at mrlinfo.org. At Reed Health, we are prepared to safely deliver all essential medical care. Delaying treatment for a serious condition, like a heart attack, stroke, or appendicitis, may lead to a different outcome. Don't ignore symptoms, chest pain, rapid breathing, stroke symptoms, severe abdominal pain, the worst headache of your life, confusion and not acting right. We are here for you 24-7. Reed Health has taken many steps to protect you. This is to ensure your safety so Reed can continue providing care when you need it. Reed Health, right beside you. I mean, we couldn't do what we do without First Bank and how supportive they have been throughout the years. I've had a very good experience working with First Bank. They, they have been there really with all kinds of different things that I do in my life. We consider First Bank Richmond a good friend. They're there to help us sponsor our signature events. You always are out there to help each other out. Besides the business part of it, we just get along really well. And it's, it's, it's beyond a working relationship. Hello, I'm Jenny Lahman from Morris and Rees Library. I invite you to come into the library and be inspired. <music> Discover our many programs and services. Join us for a story time. Explore your family's history. Come in and select materials from our books, music, movies, and more. We have an exceptional staff ready to serve you. So come on in and be inspired at MRL. And thanks for joining me for this edition of In Focus on Whitewater Community Television's WGTV Channel 11. I'm Eric Marsh, Executive Director of Whitewater Community Television, and I'm very glad that you're able to join me for this program. We'll talk about 4-H, um, what it is, how you can get involved, whether you are um, a young person or even an adult, because all are, um, all are needed to join 4-H and, and find out a little bit more about it. And, and before you tune things off because you're going, oh, it's 4-H, it's about farm animals. No, it's really not. 4-H um, is a lot more than, than some people know. And, and having not grown up in and around 4-H through my years of, of going to the fair and having a chance to really speak to some of the, the students involved with 4-H, I have found out a lot about the number of different projects and things that they can do that have absolutely nothing to do with farming and animals. But farming and animals and learning about that is even important. So hopefully you'll stick around with me as we speak with Alicia Criswell. I want to remind you, first of all, that um, we are less than 70 days away from an election. I know on national news, they're kind of counting down the presidential thing. And that is important. But there is also a race for governor. Um, there's a race for Wayne County coroner. Um, there's a race for Wayne County clerk. So some of those local races, as well as school boards, um, are something that you can vote for. So if you're not interested in the national political fight, be ready to at least vote for those people that are close to your home. And you can get registered, check your registration, find out all the information you need to know without leaving the comfort of your home and your couch. So just go to indianavoters.com. That's indianavoters.com. That allows you to check your status. If you find out you're not registered, you can register there on the site. If you are already registered and want to know where your voting places are, you can find that out also. So indianavoters.com. Time is running out for you to do that. So please get that done. 
want to turn to my guest now. Um, Alicia, I have had a chance to talk to um, on a few different occasions. Normally, it's a, a hot June day um, <laughs> out someplace near some barn or something like that where we run into you and we're doing in focus at the fair. Um, but thank you for taking the time to kind of update us on what's going on with 4-H. Appreciate you being thank, here. Yeah, thanks for having me, Eric. Your title is Purdue Cooperative Extension Educator 4-H Youth Development. All right. Indeed. Do. <laughs> <laughs> right. What, what do you really do? That's right. So, you know, it's funny, too, because I think of all years, this year was one of the years, you know, with, with the pandemic and everything, that across the state, people started to ask, maybe for the first time, what is Purdue's affiliation with the 4-H program anyways? And so, you know, we had to kind of think, well, yeah, we don't talk an awful lot about that. Um, so the Purdue Cooperative Extension piece, um, Purdue University is the land grant university in Indiana. Um, most states have a land grant university. Um, some of those are older land grants, um, 1800 land grants all the way up to some mid um, 1900 land grants. Um, and those are funded partly through federal dollars, partly through state dollars. Um, and began mostly as research institutions. And so Purdue was um, just celebrated our 150th year. So we were one of the early land grants um, in the country. And the land grant universities, among other um, responsibilities and duties, are charged with housing extension, um, which is a extension then is, is the body that um, embraces and organizes the 4-H youth development program in each state. So then as the 4-H educator here in Wayne County, so I, I should back up again then, um, Purdue houses the, the extension program and then the extension exists then in all 92 counties through Purdue in Indiana. Um, the local office looks a little bit different from county to county. Um, some counties only have one youth ed or one educator, so Union County, um, just to our south, being an example of that. Some have two educators, three educators, all the way up to, you know, approximately 20 educators. Uh, an wow. example of that would be Marion County. Um, so each office looks a little bit different. We are very blessed here in Wayne County to be a three educator office now. We actually we added Elisa Warland to our team, um, making us a three educator county. Yes. In, uh, and I um, say that because I've sat in through some commissioners meetings and council meetings over the last few years where you all have been trying to get that third educator. Indeed. Yeah. You sure have. Yep. So we were a three educator office up until I think 2011. Um, and uh, due to some budget cuts, that, that, that educator position was cut from our budget. Um, but uh, the impact that Extension makes here locally um, convinced our local officials, and, and they generously funded that position for us. So we are glad to welcome Elisa, and she is handling the Health and Human Sciences and Community Development program areas now. And then Jonathan Ferris is our Agricultural and Natural Resources Educator. And then I have the pleasure and privilege of working with our 4-H youth and volunteers and families. Cool. Um, yeah. What is your relationship with 4-H even beyond your job? So um, I am one of those 4-H um, kiddos who grew up knowing no different, right? It was the expectation in my family that I would be a 4-H'er, um, and I'm actually fourth generation in my family. Um, super excited that um, our twins uh, started kindergarten this year, so they will begin their mini 4-H journey this year, and so they will be fifth generation Indiana 4-H'ers, which is very, very cool. Um, so I bleed green. I'm one of those folks. <laughs> <laughs> um, my great-grandpa was involved in 4-H in Henry County um, in the early 1900s and, and then on up. So just a very cool, you know, generational 
um, background, um, you know, that has kind of seen the the change um, of 4-H being, you know, as you alluded to, Eric, that, that agricultural program for youth on up to what we've seen it become today, uh, because you don't exist for a hundred and some years and, and not change and adapt. So it's cool, you know, to, to see the, the evolvement of, of that program. For those, again, like me, who didn't grow up around 4-H um, and don't know what the 4-Hs stand for, talk about that and, and what that means in terms of youth development. Yeah, yeah. So we are um, the largest youth serving organization in the United States um, with approximately 6 million youth involved. Wow, um, that's saying something. I didn't, yeah. I didn't realize that. Bigger than Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, mm -hmm. Boys and Girls Scouts, all of them. Wow. Yeah, yeah. A lot of people don't realize that um, because I think too, right, we do have this perception. I, I think it's super common um, when I ask people, you know, if you think about 4-H, what comes to mind? And oftentimes think of um, a youth um, holding the halter of some livestock. Um, and most generally, it seems to be a cow, right? A steer. Um, yeah. And that's what we have in our in our picture. I, I think that that's what um, a lot of our promotion has kind of centered around over the years. Um, but, but like I said, you know, that, that's changed quite a bit, even in just, you know, my 30 years um, of exposure to this program. So through as youth in 4-H and then up to, to my educator position. Um, so the H is then... Uh, reinforce that positive youth development that that we try to implement and expose youth from you know the very beginning of their involvement in our program up to their graduation or or their ten years um, of completion. So it is, and we we have a pledge that goes along with this. But our head to clearer thinking, our heart to greater loyalty our hands to larger service, and our health to better living. And we push that to our club, um, our community, our country, and our world. So really focusing on the whole youth um, and the, the positive development that happens, you know, with exposure, positive programming, and positive um, role models in a, in a youth's life. We talk about the 4-H fair. And that's really how it's how it's built. And for some, the fair portion of it, the rides, the lemon shakeups, the elephant ears, that type thing is is what they know. For another side of, of kids, and for another group of adults and people, it's something much more intense than that. Mm -hmm. During this pandemic, we lost what we know of, what some of us know of, as the 4-H fair. Mm -hmm. But through some hard work, through some thought, you all were able to, to really take care of the 4-H part of things. Can you talk about what was able to happen for the youth involved with this? Absolutely. So, you know, I think, too, and, and again, this is one of those things we just take for granted because on a normal year, it just all happens, right? And, and this year has been anything but normal for all people. I can't imagine that there's a person out there who hasn't been directly affected by, um, you know, the, the things that we're facing um, this year in, in some way. Um, so our, our program, the way that we're structured here in Wayne County, um, our, fair board, our fair committee actually falls under the Wayne County 4-H Association. So our fair committee is an amazing group of volunteers who are led by um, the wonderful Sandy House, who has led that committee for a number of years. And she's just an amazing person with an amazing heart for the 4-H program. And she is just an organizer and a doer. Um, so those volunteers who um, work with Sandy are actually Wayne County 4-H volunteers. So um, the, the, the fair, as we know it in Wayne County, as that whole experience, all falls under that 4-H umbrella. Um, and Sandy and her crew 
um, work to make sure that there are vendors and all of that yummy, high calorie food out there for us, right? You gotta have that energy to sustain (laughs) us, yes. And um, bring in Poor Jack Amusements um, so that those kiddos and families have a place to go out and, and really have some fun and some thrills and then all the entertainment that we experience and all of the educational pieces that Sandy makes sure are in place for us each year. And then our office here at the Purdue Extension office, which is located on the Wayne County Fairgrounds, works to um, organize and execute the those those projects, right, that then become the highlight of sort of the south end of the fairgrounds. Um, those 4,000 um, non-walking projects that we see every year in the Coleman Center, the, the non-walkers, right, we hope those yes. don't walk that's what we hope Um, and then we've got all of those walking projects um, outside in the barns and um, usually have somewhere in the range of a thousand um, of those walking projects as well so um, it it is a it's a group effort and involves over a hundred volunteers annually to make the the whole event sort of happen And so when COVID hit this year, it became evident that for a number of reasons, um, first and foremost, you know, the safety and well-being of our families and our communities, that it was not a responsible choice to um, bring so many people together because we do usually have somewhere in the neighborhood, if we have good weather, of course, and yes. uh, you know well that if, if one thing is promised, it will rain during the County 4-H Fair. At some um, point. At some point. And not just rain, usually some sort of like skies open up and it dumps on us, kind of a rain. Uh, and so uh, when, when COVID hit, it, it, became, um, it became obvious that that was just not a, a good a good scenario for us to have, you know, over a hundred thousand people out here on a non rainy year, um, you know, exposed to people from all over the state um, and in different parts of the country um, in a lot of cases. So Sandy and her crew made the decision um, to uh, eliminate the carnival from the, this year's fair, um, our vendors, our entertainment, and that if local officials and state and local restrictions would allow it, that we would move forward with allowing our 4-H youth to highlight the work that they have um, put towards their projects um, beginning now. So, so the, so the program year really starts October 1. And, and um, even before that, some of our youth are working, you know, through different projects and, and with different livestock. So we, it was really important to all of us um, that we really focus our efforts on allowing those youth to celebrate this, their accomplishments um, that they've worked hard towards uh, for a number of months and especially this year um, most of their opportunities you know that so many of them look forward to in the winter and spring months you know proms and graduations and different sporting events and celebrations you know and and for every kiddo you know the advancement to the next grade level those things didn't get to happen this year for a lot of our youth and so more than ever it became important to us that if we could give them any type of a of a showcase to sit of the to for their success um, that we allow that to move forward so we worked hard here in the office and our volunteers put in a lot of hours and and our families hung in there with us and we were able to um to carry on with the uh non-walking project judging uh we did that virtually and then brought in livestock um and those projects and those for exhibit this year and and really had a great event and and had wonderful participation and wonderful local support it, it was wonderful nice you're watching in focus on whitewater community television's wgtv channel 11 was speaking with uh, Alicia Criswell, who is Purdue Cooperative Extension Educator, 4-H Youth Development. Getting into um, 4-H and its um, evolution for the youth. You mentioned your starting kindergarten and getting into that mini 4-H. Talk a little bit about the amount of time 
that kids spend in the program and, and how that development happens? Sure. Yeah. So I, I think a lot of people too, right? They see, um, they see all of those projects in June at the fair. And so it seems like, okay, so this, you know, this 4-H program is kind of a summer program. So, so the fair though is the culmination. It, it's that, that grand celebratory event for our youth to showcase what they've worked on in many cases for a full year. Um, so uh, when, when you think about, you know, one of those steers, well, that steer, you know, now weighs 1,500 pounds. It certainly didn't start out that way. And so there's been a lot of work and effort going into, you know, making that happen. We think about our horse and pony kiddos. They've been riding for many of them, you know, for years um, before they're comfortable enough and skilled enough to then um, come out and compete, you know, in our horse and pony events. And then even thinking about, you know, many of our Coleman Center projects, um, there are youth who work many, many months on some of our woodworking projects. Um, some of our um, our shooting sports program, you know, it, it typically begins in the fall and then culminates in, in the summer. Um, so many folks, I think, sometimes forget the amount of time and work uh, and sometimes lessons, you know, and multiple workshops that have gone into um, creating something so grand from nothing and that youth really developing those skills and through trial and error, um, having that really successful culminating project to, to exhibit that the public then is able to come see in June. What's the age at which kids begin in 4-H and how is that training taking place through the years? Because at, at the end of it all, there, there is um, actually the Friday before the fair opens for most of us, um, there's actually a ceremony for those that have been involved in for, for 10 years. Talk about the age progression and what happens as, the, as they get older. Yeah. So beginning in kindergarten, um, youth can join 4-H and our mini 4-H program is K through 2. So those youth then can participate in most of our livestock projects, um, but they have their own sort of show that's typically for most species um, previous, it, it, it's right before the, um, the actual show for that species of our regular 4-H members begin. So they have their own class and they come out. Um, and for any animals that weigh over 300 pounds, we always have an adult um, or a regular 4-H member with those youth because, you know, I, I, as a mom and a 4-H educator, you know, you see those, those third graders out there with, you know, that 1,800 pound steer on the, the end of a halter and that's nerve wracking enough and you put a tiny little kindergartner out there and I will hand it to them. Some of those kids, no problemo. They don't even bat an eye. Um, but it's just something about having that adult out there with them makes me feel better and as, sure. as an educator and a mom. <laughs> so um, those youth can exhibit those livestock and then they can also do most of our Coleman Center projects, uh, but they are all non-competitive. So we like to think of our kindergarten, first and second grade experience, that mini 4-H, as just exploratory. It gives them the opportunity, you know, to say, well, you know, I've always wanted to do ceramics. What does that involve? Or I've wanted to do cake decorating or electric. What does that involve? What does that mean? Is this something, you know, that I'd like to develop my skills in, um, you know, and kind of take to the next level and then become competitive with? So um, those first three years are just exploratory, and we encourage our families, um, our youth, our parents, and guardians to just have fun with those projects. Um, to learn by doing, which is, you know, the, um, the model that we use in 4-H. Um, that ex experiential learning, the learn by doing, um, and, and just, you know, see if it's something that they enjoy and that they'd like to learn more about, and just to jump around here and there, right? It's not something that there's pressure to take 20 projects. Um, take a couple and just see what you like and what you enjoy. And then beginning in third grade, um, 4-Hers then transition to what we just refer to as our regular 4-H program, and that is where uh, the, the competitive nature of 4-H begins, uh, both for our livestock and our, our static or non-walking projects, 
And, um, you know, we encourage youth then to really hone in on some of those skills that they would like to develop, uh, potentially for some as a career, um, potentially some, you know, we've had many 4-H alumni who have participated in our photography um, project, two of them went on to be, you know, professional photographers. Um, and, you know, the same with our electric program. Um, I know that some of the youth who have started, you know, with the little third grade first year circuit boards who are now linemen um, working for Duke Energy. Uh, and so it's very cool, you know, to see those skills develop and, and in some cases become a paid hobby or a paid profession for those youth. Um, and then, Eric, as you alluded to, um, in Indiana, there is a, a great um, just sort of intrinsic and even extrinsic um, motivating factor of achieving that 10-year status in 4-H. So if you begin as a third grade youth and you participate up until and through your senior year, you achieve that 10-year recognition um, in Indiana. In Wayne County this year, I believe we had 39 youth achieve 10-year status, um, and we celebrated 53 graduating seniors. So 39 10-year and 53 um, youth were somewhere then um, between 10 and, and even their first year. We had a youth this year who was a graduating senior, and this was her first year in 4-H. So, um, and we love to see those youth get involved too, you know, and there was, there was a program that she found out about as a senior in high school and she said, I don't care how many years I do it, I just really want to do it. Um, and we welcome those youth as well. So, such a neat thing though, to get to, you know, as an educator, see that kindergartner start out and then, you know, be able to celebrate them as, as they walk across the stage as a graduating senior, you know, after 13 years in our program. So, it, it's a really, for me, you know, that's, that, that's the day in and day out stuff that, that really makes this, this program so unique. There's very few educators that get to say they were with that child every year from the time they were in kindergarten up until um, they finished their, their senior year of high school. How do youth find where they can participate? How do they find some of the various clubs that we hear about? Um, how do they connect to you? Yeah. So um, they, they will start to see us. We will hopefully become very visible here in just a few weeks um, because our the statewide enrollment period begins on October the 1st. Um, and that's an annual window. We begin October 1st and then um, we'll close our active enrollment period on January 15th. Um, so we try to um, promote ourselves through a number of different avenues. Um, so, you know, being here on, uh, with you today, Eric, I'm in focus, and, and we appreciate that, and um, through communities and schools and um, all the different school corporations, through the Boys and Girls Club, um, through different billboard campaigns, um, we hope to be very visible here for the next few months, and uh, youth can visit our website and our Facebook page, and then connect with us directly um, through phone or email to learn more about the program. We do have um, approximately 30 clubs across Wayne County. Um, some of them are project specific, um, like our shooting sports program that is um, our sharpshooters club is, is project specific. Um, some of our horse and pony clubs, our dog club, tractor club are project specific. But then we do have many clubs that are just general and open for everyone, uh, regardless of what clubs or what projects they participate in. Um, and they're just general clubs that just do general activities and uh, provide general information for youth, regardless of, of what types of things that they're involved with. So um, we like to work with families individually to sort of work through which clubs will best um, meet their needs, depending on. Um, a lot of times their geographical location. So if they're looking, you know, for a club that's close to home, mm -hmm. um, sometimes depending on the projects or activities that their, their kiddos are, are interested in, um, sometimes it's a certain day of the week. You know, we've had families who say, Wednesdays are good days for us. What clubs meet on Wednesday evenings? And we can plug them into that as well. So we, we really like to um, connect with our families individually and work with them to figure out what sort of a, a path will work the best for them and be most conducive to their family. 
you find kids who you don't know where their interest is going to be. You can mm -hmm. find a kid living in the middle of Richmond that might be interested in learning how to raise chickens or raise a steer or do something along those lines. You might find a kid out in the country that wants to do photography or that type of thing. Um, how do you, do, do you work with other youth serving organizations to help bring this message to like, uh, you know, boys and girls club, youth development isn't a competitive sport, I don't think. Kids exactly. can be in a lot of different places. So how are you making those connections with some of the other youth serving organizations to find new members? And what's your membership like right now? Yeah, so Eric, it's so, I, I love that you mentioned that because, you know, in talking with other educators across the state, um, there seems to be this, this very territorial nature, right, between youth serving organizations in some counties. And again, we are just so blessed here in Wayne County because I think as youth serving folks, we've all kind of sat in the same room and said, you know what, our end mission and goal are, they're very similar and why not work together? Um, you know, we all bring different skills and different opportunities to the table. And so let's, you know, my youth are your youth and we're all working together um, to create, you know, the next generation of, of leaders. And so, you know, in, in working together and, and putting those resources together. So we actually work very closely with the Boys and Girls Club of Wayne County. We have actual chartered 4-H clubs um, in four different um, units of the Boys and Girls Club, and we work with them on a monthly basis um, and give those youth the opportunity to experience usually three to four different projects that they work on from beginning to completion, and then those projects are, are exhibited and participate competitively at the, the annual Wayne County 4-H Fair, just the same as, as every other 4-H youth member. Um, so uh, we've also worked with Girls Inc., um, in the past, we've worked with the YMCA in Richmond, um, and so it's just good, you know, to, to work together as youth serving organizations and to bring opportunities to those youth, regardless of whether they end up competing with us through 4-H. Um, that's another thing I think that sometimes uh, folks don't realize is that we are a positive youth development program. So you don't have to complete a project for um, exhibition or competition at the 4-H fair to participate in 4-H. We have a lot of youth who, who, who work with us through, you know, our junior leaders program or through um, our EV Grand Prix or our motorsports program who never exhibit a thing annually at the 4-H Fair. And that's okay. We love those youth and embrace them just the same. Um, so uh, to answer your question, we have about um, 900 youth who are engaged with us annually um, nice. and would love to see it get to the point where, where we're at 1,000 consistently every year. I, you know, in a perfect world, I'd love to see where, where we have every single youth in Wayne County involved in our program. Um, but, but we definitely would love to hit that magic millennial number um, at some point. You're watching In Focus on Whitewater Community Television's WGTV Channel 11. Uh, thanks to our sponsors for this program, First Bank Richmond, um, Reed Health, and Morrison Reeves Library. We're speaking with Alicia Criswell, Purdue Cooperative Extension Educator for H Youth Development. Um, we've, you, we've alluded a little bit, and you've mentioned a few of them just in passing, um, particularly in some of the um, non-walking, as it were, projects that people can do. And you also mentioned very early about the changes um, in 4-H. And, and you just mentioned the motorsports, which is something I think that has developed here just over the last uh, three to five years, maybe. Mm -hmm. Is that right? Yep. Mm -hmm. You're Talk right. Talk a little bit about that program and some of the other non-walking, as we say, programs that youth can get involved with or projects that youth can get involved with. Yeah, absolutely. So I tell you, that motorsports program, um, Wayne County 4-H is known across the state um, amongst extension circles for that program. And it was actually just sort of by accident that we, we sort of tripped into that. So um, 
it was actually, oh gosh, I always struggle with the year on that. I, I want to say it was 2017 um, that we hosted the National um, 4-H Extension Educators Conference in Indianapolis, um, which brings about a thousand um, 4-H youth educators to um location for professional development opportunities. So when Indy hosted that in 2017, uh, you know, I'm, we're, we're known across the country for racing, right? And so right there, downtown Indianapolis, close access to the Speedway, we sort of um, centered our theme on the, the crossroads of America there with that Indy car kind of being at, at the helm. Um, and so I, each of us from Indiana were asked to volunteer for a, um, what we call um, an on-the-go experience. So one of those was a behind-the-scenes tour of the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. So my husband and I are, are avid Indy um, race fans, and um, we're season ticket holders for the Indianapolis um, 500. And so I thought, well, shoot, I'm going to sign up, you know, and, and, and be a, a chaperone, so to speak, for that event. So upon doing that, I learned of the, um, the motorsports program through Purdue University. I had no idea, being an employee even of Purdue University, that there was a motorsports program. Um, and that day I met Danny White, and he presented um, some information about a collegiate um, motors, motorsports program that they were working with um, that was transitioning to include high school youth. Um, and that is the EV Grand Prix program. And you, you can actually find that online. It's evgrandprix.org. And it is an electric go-kart program where um, youth work together in teams to build an electric powered, a battery powered go-kart from um, a kit. So basically pieces that, and, and it comes very much in pieces to a, <laughs> oh, it's an experience. A lot of pieces. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of pieces to an actual um, lithium battery powered go-kart that you put a youth in and you race it. And there are, it's a sanctioned program, um, safety very much at the focus um, of, of that program. But you really, you know, you talk about an experiential program um, that just pulls all of the pieces of STEM, right? Science, technology, engineering, and math, along with so many career preparation opportunities for these youth. And they build this go-kart, they engineer it, they work on the physics and the weight and the you know, even down to the positioning of the seat, depending on the size of the driver, um, to make that car aerodynamic and fast. Um, and then you've got to not only be fast, but your, your batteries have to last for the duration of this, this event. You don't want to die right there on the track, right? Um, so in our first year, and, and oh, Eric, it was a train wreck. Anything that could have went wrong, went wrong, including getting the kit, which comes from Italy, stuck in customs during a nor'eastern to the point that somebody from Avon, Indiana had to drive out to New Jersey to try to pull our kit off of a shipping container. Oh. It was it was something else. But we, we made it happen, and in that first year, we placed second at the World Final at yes. the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. We were the only um, 4-H team in the world at that point, and um, it was something else. And if, it really showed how resilient 4-H youth are because those, those youth, they just, they, they, they made it happen despite a, a whole stack of circumstances against them. And another cool part about that program is it's not just the race and, and the cart. Um, there is a, a piece to that that accounts for about 40% of the overall program um, about marketing and presentation and being able to show a panel of adults how you engineered the car, why you made the choices that you did, um, and, and also how you, you determined your setup. Um, so why you set the cart up the way you did, um, what your strategy was, um, and 
it's always really cool because the, those adults tell us year after year, your 4-H youth blow that, they blow that part out of the water. Like they, we can't even compare them to the other high school youth. And we always laugh and say, you know, great youth are, are used to talking to adults. They do it year after year after year because they've got these projects and they, they show those off and talk about them with an adult every year. It's just part of what they do. And so they're very comfortable getting up and, you know, and the, and practicing those public speaking skills. So it's just such a cool program. Not only are the projects judged here locally, but some of them actually get to go to the state fair. Talk about that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, many of our, our non-walking, our static projects um, advance, they promote to the Indiana State Fair. And so if you are in the, the top um, of, in some cases, your division, um, and in some cases, the project as a whole, um, you advance to the Indiana State Fair and represent Wayne County um, amongst youth from across the state of Indiana. Um, and in, in some cases, and, and even here recently, we've had um, many youth be very successful um, and achieve what they um, refer to at the Indiana State Fair as um, a showcase project. Um, and those are basically the best of the best um, within a certain division from across the state of Indiana. So um, this year, uh, Howard Hobson, now the, the Indiana State Fair not walking projects this year were all virtual, um, but Howard Hobson was one of the uh, 20 youth who was a showcase project from across Indiana, and he had this incredible um, shooting sports educational display um, that went on and was chosen as one of the 20 best projects from the thousands um, across Indiana, and we're, we're very proud of his success this year. Some of the projects vary, and I can rattle off some just from what I've seen, but you can fill in some of the gaps. I know there's woodworking. I know there is electricity. You've mentioned that. Um, photography, baking, sewing. What are some of the things that I'm, that I'm missing that, that you know, might grab a youth's attention to go, you know, I'd like to know more about that or do that? Right. So one of the ones that is, is definitely attractive for our younger youth is our Construction Toys Project. Um, it's one of our larger projects of our non-walking, um, and that is literally taking a construction toy, whether it's Legos, Kinects, um, Lincoln Logs, any type of construction toy, and um, there are, are very loose guidelines for the youth to follow, and they create a project um, from those Legos or, or Connects or um, whatever the, the, their choice of, of construction toys is. Um, we have the Sand Art Project, so youth who enjoy crafts. Um, they can do sand dart, latch hook, macrame. Uh, we have a miscellaneous crafts, um, ceramics. Um, I'm trying to think about what else is back there in that corner during that week of fair, right? Um, but there are thousands of projects back there that youth do um, that are involved in, in different craft projects. And they're amazing. Painting, drawing um, are also big projects for us. Recycling. Um, we are starting a project beginning in 2021 that is going to be a refurbished project. So taking something old and either refurbishing it to its original um, estate or um, refurbishing it to using um, you know, maybe things that were original to it, but to refurbish it back to the state of usefulness. So we're really excited um, to get that kicked off too. You know, there's, there's lots of different interests out there and, and we've got a little something for everyone. Some of the projects actually, though, are not just kids. Adults can be involved in some of this also. <laughs> yeah. So um, through our Extension Homemakers program, we um, every year ho host an open class event, although that was not able to move forward this year um, because, um, you know, 
unfortunately with the COVID um, pandemic, um, those that that particular group made the decision that it just probably wasn't in the best interest um, of some of the audiences that they serve. To, to have that event this year, um, but they do host an, an open class event, which we like to say is sort of like 4-H for adults, um, where they can also compete in many of those same divisions. It's not 4-H, but it's an open class event um, where some of those um, adults who are interested in or have those types of hobbies as well can participate. And that includes, I know, baking, um, uh-huh. quilting. I know quilting yep. is, is big with that one. It is, it is, um, as well as are the different horticulture um, divisions. So um, they, they have floriculture, gardening, um, they do um, different types of, of herbs and, and, and things along with that too. So there's lots of different options for that as well. You're watching In Focus on Whitewater Community Television's WGTV Channel 11. Thanks to our sponsors for this particular program, Morrison Reeves Library, Reed Health, and First Bank Richmond. We're speaking with Alicia Criswell, Purdue Cooperative Extension Educator for H Youth Development. Um, if you've got close to 900 youth involved in a variety of um, projects and you are trying to get even more you probably need people, you probably need adults, um, you need volunteers. Talk a little bit about that need, the kind of time someone would need to put into it, what skill set you're looking for them to have, anything that they need to know. Yeah, absolutely. So just like we try to really, you know, individualize the 4-H experience for the youth who are involved, um, we also welcome adults who have lots of different skill sets and lots of different um, passions um, and and try to to put engage them in the program, you know, in a way to support our mission of positive youth development, um, while also, you know, working with youth as, as a mentor and, and in guiding some skill sets. So, um, you know, the time that it requires very much depends on, on how they would like to get involved. And we welcome adults who, you know, only have an hour to give through the program year, all the way up to who say, you know what, if I had it my way, I'd give 40 hours a week to this program. Um, and, and so we very much welcome and appreciate any and all time that our volunteers give. Um, there is a, um, an application process for that because, of course, um, we are charged with keeping those 900 youth safe. Um, and we um, take that very seriously. Um, so there is um, a, an application process and a background check, um, as, as well as some trainings um, that go into that. Um, that's not terribly time intensive, but we do make sure, um, you know, that our volunteers are, are well equipped to handle um, the responsibility and the, um, the, the load that comes with um, mentoring youth. Um, we also know that through a lot of different studies um, across the country that, you know, having that one positive adult in a youth's life can make the difference for a youth between, you know, being a successful adult with who, who's able to achieve, you know, dreams and aspirations and pursue, you know, their passions and their goals to a youth who is not able to to become a successful adult because they weren't given exposure to somebody you know who who was willing to mentor them and and help them on that positive path so it's so important to us that we have you know a variety of volunteers who are involved in a variety of different um you know interests and sometimes it's just they love kids and they're willing to, to spend an hour or two here and there mentoring a kiddo, you know, just, and it may be just taking them, you know, to go shoot some pictures, you know, at the reservoir, but just to talk with them and engage them and to let that youth know that they always have somebody who cares about them and who has somebody who's got their best interests in mind. Um, so there's lots of different ways to get involved with us. You know, we, we, we love folks who are involved in, in those very specific skills, like, you know, being able to, to build an electric go-kart, you know, that comes in 5,000 pieces and, and, and help youth as they're hooking that up to a very high powered lithium battery. <laughs> That's right? not me. No, not me either. <laughs> I can cheer them 
on, um, but I certainly don't want to be the ones that are, you know, deciding what connects to what. That's not where I want to be. Um, you know, all the way who's like, you know what? I have a hard time drawing a stick figure, but I do really love kids and I'd be happy, you know, to make sure that they all stay safe while we go on this outing. Um, so you do not have to be a person who is an expert in anything. We just um, welcome people who really love kiddos and who really want to be involved in, in making sure that our youth are prepared for the leadership and the citizenship that they're going to need as they grow and mature. We should talk about the financial aspect of this. Sometimes as you start to get into to some projects, particularly when you're trying to um, raise a 1,500 pound steer or something along those lines, there are um, financial restrictions that might keep people from becoming involved. Um, let's talk a little bit about what's expected financially when someone gets involved with 4-H and how that's sure. handled. Sure, yeah. So, you know, we, we like to, we try really hard um, to take the financial barrier out when, when we're able to. So to, to join our program um, for our kindergarten, first and second grade, it's $10 per year. Um, and that's the, the entire year. Um, now, that's not necessarily all of the project expenses that you may accrue, um, but that's very much dependent on what types of projects, you know, your family decides to get involved with as well. Um, some of the projects are, are very low cost or even no cost. Um, some, you know, can, can be very high cost, like some of those livestock projects. But again, we try to have something for every youth regardless of their financial situation. Um, for our third through 12th graders, the annual program fee is $25. Um, and again, that's the entire year. Um, and, but, but is dependent, you know, can be, can be more depending on what types of projects um, that they decide to participate in. We do um, through the generous um, uh, donations and sponsorship of uh, a lot of different local businesses, organizations, and individuals um, have funds available to support youth who um, would be unable to participate because of different financial concerns. So we try very hard to not let money um, or finances be a barrier for youth to access our program. Um, we want youth to be able to come to us regardless of their, their family's financial situation. Um, but you know, there, there are um, certainly places where projects can get um, quite expensive. Um, and, but, but like I said, we have some wonderful supporters. Um, our, our dog program, for example, we um, were needing new, new dog agility equipment so that our um, participants who participate in our dog obedience and agility program um, can safely train and work with their dogs. And um, the support of Heartland and Blue, um, Blue Buffalo, we were able to purchase some new equipment for those kiddos. So, so we do have wonderful supporters here in Wayne County. Um, Duke Energy uh, is a huge supporter of our, of our EV Grand Prix our Motorsports program, um, you know, to offset some of those costs so that our families um, don't feel a financial burden. We've got a couple minutes left, and I know I've thrown a lot of things on the table, but there may be something, particularly since you're nearing the beginning, the kind of opening of your season, as it were, that I didn't ask you about or that you want to go back and reiterate. You've got a couple minutes here on the table. Talk to the community and let them know what you need them to know. Awesome. Thanks, Eric. So um, we are really excited about um, kicking off the 2020-2021 uh, program year and knowing that, you know, we never would have dreamed that we would be standing where we're standing um, a year ago. Um, but we've, we've adapted and uh, just like everyone has, right, had to punt in some, some cases. Um, but we are doing a lot of really great programs virtually for those families or youth who, um, you know, for a number of reasons are unable to participate um, in school programs or other programs um, on a face-to-face -face basis. So please don't let um, the, the health considerations um, deter you from participating in the program. We can fully plug you in virtually um, if, if that meets the need of your family. We're also 
excited about getting involved in some areas of Richmond that we feel like we haven't been able to fully reach um, because of logistical reasons um, in the past. So looking to start a couple of new clubs this year um, within Richmond City Limits to make our program a bit more accessible for youth who might not be able to travel or have transportation to um, attend, you know, night meetings, weekend meetings, those types of things. We're going to try to bring programming to those youth um, and 4-H opportunities to those youth this year. So um, if, if you're interested, um, we are always happy to, to speak with, um, you know, youth or families um, on that individual basis and talk through what their interests might be and get them plugged in um, with volunteers and projects that would most um, or best meet their needs. So, you know, don't ever hesitate or think, well, you know, 4-H probably doesn't have anything for our family. Um, we've got over 70 different paths um, that we can that we can plug families into. And in most cases, it makes sense for families and, and individual youth to be involved in several of those different paths. But we can definitely um, accommodate different levels of time, different levels of interests and needs, and, and we're just really excited to be able to sort of spread that message and include families who maybe in the past have thought, you know, there's just nothing there for us. We, we think there is, and, and we would like the opportunity um, to embrace those families and, and get them involved. We should thank you for your time today. Um, and thank you for all you're doing for the youth of Wayne County. It really is appreciated. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. Want to remind you as we get ready to head out that um, we are getting close to, to the time where you need to be able to vote. And we are encouraging you to be registered to vote. So please feel free to check your voting status find out um, whether you're registered or not. If you're not registered, you can register. If you are registered, you can find out where your polling places are. You can do all that at one place, indianavoters.com. That's indianavoters.com. You've only got another couple of weeks to be able to get that done, so please do that. Um, also want to remind you that the Richmond Farmers Market continues on on Saturday, so definitely go check that out between 8 a.m. and noon. They've got some entertainment, and obviously as we're heading into the fall time, some great fall vegetables and fruits and things of that nature, so definitely go check that out. If you missed any of this program and want to see it, want to remind you that replays of this show begin tonight at 1030, Friday at 8 p.m., Saturdays at 8 a.m. and 9 p.m., and Sundays at 8 a.m. and 1 p.m. Audio replays of this program can be heard on 1490 a.m. and 100.9 FM, ESPN Radio, WKBV, and their sister station, G1013, Sundays at 6 a.m. Again, I'd like to thank Alicia for spending some time with us and remind you that we will be back next week with another In Focus program. We're beginning to plan what we're going to do for our In Focus candidate forum, so those will be coming up. In the meantime, thank you very much. I hope you have a great weekend, and as always, I wish you well. This broadcast of In Focus is being made possible through the support of Reed Health. Reed Health, right beside you. And by First Bank Richmond, with eight locations serving Wayne County. First Bank Richmond and you, doing great things together. And by Morrison Reeves Library, where you can check out an endless variety of movies, binge-worthy TV series, graphic novels, books, games, toys, and CDs. Stream movies and audiobooks with the MRL Digital Library, open 24-7. Visit MRL Downtown Richmond or online at mrlinfo.org.